Tiny you can use. Echoey, I guess. Yeah, we're all good. We ready? Okay, I'm uh, Ronnie Bull. I'm going to present to you on man in the middle attacks and virtualized environments. If I don't take out the screen first, um, how many of you guys uh, operate data centers in here or host things in data centers in the cloud? Okay, quite a few of you. Good. Um, how many of you have actually seen variations of this talk before? I've presented this at DEF CON and a few other places. Okay, so I got a lot of students in this room um, who've been there kind of through the paces here. A little bit about me, uh, I have a PhD in computer science from Clarkson University. Actually, the previous speaker was my PhD advisor, uh, Gina Matthews, and she's done a lot of this uh, over overseeing of this work with me um, over the past four years, so I, I appreciate a lot of what she's done for me. Um, I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Utica College. I specialize in networking, systems administration, information security, virtualization, Linux, Unix, and voice over IP. Um, I'm also a co-founder and member of the board of directors for the Central New York Hackathon, which a lot of the people in this room are, are participants of each year. Um, and you can get more information on that at cnyhackathon.org. Um, and I also am the owner and principal consultant of Adirondack IT Solutions, which is a small independent consulting company for um, IT work uh, in the area. Also, I do a lot of work for the Air Force, uh, high level research, that kind of stuff. Okay, so publication history of this research um, goes all the way back to DerbyCon uh, 4.0. Started when I presented on Mac flooding attacks. Um, did some stuff uh, with B Sides Rock on 2015, DEF CON two times in a row, and then we had a publication in a journal um, detailing the MAC flooding attacks and the DHCP scenarios. Uh, defended my dissertation on the 29th of September, and then recently uh, in February I was invited to talk um, on this talk out in Norway at HackCon, uh, which was a very great experience, and if any of you guys get a chance to get out there, it's a conference worth going out to and seeing um, and experiencing. Okay, so the roadmap. Uh, we're gonna just talk a little bit about Virtualization, multi-tenant environments, cloud services, just a high-level overview of what they are, um, which most of you probably kind of have a good grasp on that by now. Um, talk about the test platforms that were used for this research, um, as well as uh, specific attacks and results. We're going to talk about VLAN hopping today and our poisoning man-in-the-middle attacks, and then present some conclusions. So the key question, we have multi-tenant environments. Um, you're hosting data in these environments. You have multiple virtual machines hosting these environments. And with that, it is a multi-tenant environment. So you and maybe your competitors are also hosted within that same um, ecosystem. So it's an important question to explore because we have these layer two devices um, that are being virtualized and emulated in these, in these networks. Uh, so layer two switches, uh, for instance. So do these layer two network attacks that we've known that worked on physical devices over the past, say, 20 years or more, do they actually apply in these virtualized networks? So that was the, the basis of my research. That was my thesis question. Um, this is very important to explore because you know, all cloud services that rely on virtualization could be vulnerable to attacks. Um, includes data centers hosting mission, mission critical or sensitive data. And I found through my research, a lot of these attacks that I presented over the few years do affect um, outside activity on the physical network itself. So not only does it affect systems in the virtualized networks, but you can use it to leverage to get outside of the virtual network onto the actual data structure infrastructure or data center infrastructure. Um, so there's an old lesson here, we're vulnerable to those that are close to us. So if we're hosted on the same system as our competitors, we may actually um, have issues with that. So what if, this is our basic scenario. Um, we have our host operating system, right? Zen server, Proxmox, VMware, whatever you want to use, it doesn't really matter at this uh, point. What this research was really focused on was the, the virtual networking devices. So we have hypervisors, but different hypervisors utilize different types of virtualized networking devices at layer two, layer three. Um, in this case, we're looking at virtual bridges or switches. So some implementations use the virtual switching, um, like OpenV switch, um, Hyper-V has a switch too. Uh, or we're looking at um, bridging. So things like uh, Linux kernel bridging, um, which is mostly used by things like KVM, open source Zen, uh, Proxmox environments. So as you can see here, all these devices or all these systems are actually connected to that uh, virtual network interface here. Um, and we could have a malicious actor on that network. So what could they do with that? How could they actually leverage being on that same network? Um, what kind of things could be uh, gathered from the network traffic? So this research has proved that virtualized network devices do actually have the potential to be exploited in the same manner as their physical counterparts. Um, and like I said before, sometimes this stuff can actually escape and get out into that physical realm. So consequences, what happens if we can successfully launch a layer two networking attack within a virtualized environment? Well, we can capture all the network traffic, right? Redirect it, um, perform man in the middle attacks, denial of services, gain unauthorized access to restricted subnetworks by doing VLAN hopping attacks, maybe jump over to a different VLAN or a different subnet. And we can also just play an effect performance by just cluttering up the traffic on the network. So some test scenarios and results. Uh, we have VLAN hopping, I got a few scenario descriptions, I have some demos here we can go through, um, ARP poisoning. 
So here's the old test environment. Um, I was teaching at SUNY Poly for a while, and we developed this test environment out of a whole bunch of uh, extra equipment we had lying around there. Um, so you have a lot of 1U Dell servers in here. We have a couple customized servers as well. Um, we can see the specs here. Uh, basically, every single major hypervisor platform at that time uh, was, was tested and used in this environment, so we set these all up. And we tried to, to keep the hardware similar, but it's important to realize in this, in this uh, research, the hardware really didn't matter because we were looking at the networking devices. So we weren't really testing performance. And I shouldn't say that because we did test performance in the Mac flooding. Um, that was about the only time when we were looking at how the flooding affected the performance of the network. And in that case, a faster system with a faster processor could have handled that traffic a little bit better. Uh, but for the most part, we're testing VLAN hopping, things like that. We're just looking at the networking devices. Um, but we still try to keep things similar. So here's after $30,000 of funding when I moved over to Utica College. All brand new Supermicro servers, um, wired up nice and pretty. You know, we did quite a bit of work here to get this thing looking nice. Um, each individual system has identical hardware. So we're looking at 1U Supermicro servers with Intel Xeon X3, 1240 V3 quad-core processors, 32 gigs of RAM each. They each had a 500 gigabyte Western Digital hard drive, and four onboard Intel Gigabit network interface cards. So that was nice when I wanted to set up different networks um, that I could set the VMs on to do the different uh, attacks for VLAN hopping and stuff. You can also see when I moved to the new environment, I upgraded all of the, um, the hypervisors to the newer versions that were out at that point in time. Um, this was because we already did a lot of testing on the previous versions, so why not see if either A, the um, problems we found or the vulnerabilities we found still persisted in the new environments, or B, if they were fixed. So we found a lot of stuff just kept persisting through. There was really no fix um, when we moved forward, except for with the Mac flooding when uh, we actually submitted uh, the issue to Open vSwitch and we're um, it was validated, and we actually got a CVE for it, for, and they, they submitted a patch. Um, so that was a time when it actually did get fixed in the newer versions of Open vSwitch. Okay, so let's talk about VLAN hopping. So this is an attack used to gain unauthorized access to another virtual LAN on a packet switch network. So basically what we can do is jump from one VLAN to another, um, and depending on the type of attack we do, either switch spoofing or double tagging, we can have one way or, or two directional um, communications between that network. So a little bit about virtual LANs. Uh, you have Ethernet frames that are modified for VLAN traffic. And what we do is we're just going to take that normal um, Ethernet frame and we wedge in this extra VLAN tag here. It's four extra bytes of information. Um, with this, we get this VLAN ID, and that tells us where that packet belongs on that network. So here's a CVE that was published um, describing the switch spoofing a, a vulnerability on Cisco switches. Basically telling us that Cisco switches allow um, an unauthorized user to gain access to a VLAN by pretending that they're basically another Cisco switch. So they're spoofing these CDP or Cisco Discovery Protocol messages. Um, so the Cisco Discovery Protocol basically allows Cisco devices to talk to each other and tell each other about themselves. What's your operating system? Oh, my operating system is this. What does my networking look like? What are my IP addresses? My routing information? So this, these are how routers can talk to each other, how switches can talk to each other. We also have things like VTP for the VTP domain. So we can push that out to all the other switches on the network to actually configure our VLANs. Okay, so here's a couple more switch spoofing vulnerabilities uh, released. So the 2900 virtual LAN switches allow remote attackers to inject 802.1Q frames um, by forging the, the VLAN identifier in the trunking tag. So if I can get onto a switch and spoof it and say I'm, a tr I'm another switch and we're trying to make a trunk connection, as long as I can fool it to think that I should be on that same VLAN, I can start passing information bidirectionally. And directly from Cisco, DTP, Dynamic Trunking Protocol, if a switch port were configured as DTP Auto and we receive a fake DTP packet, it might become a trunk port and it might start accepting traffic destined for any VLAN. And DTP Auto is the default setting on most Cisco switches. This might be changing now in the newer versions of Cisco, but in most of the older stuff you're seeing out there, DTP Auto is still the default setting when you take it out of the box. Okay, so the dynamic trunking protocol, or this DTP we're talking about, it's a proprietary Cisco Layer 2 protocol, um, allows the automatic configuration of truck ports on Cisco switches. So when we're talking about trying to exploit switch spoofing, we're talking about Cisco environments, right? Because this is really proprietary to Cisco. Um, it provides negotiating the trunking method with neighbor devices. Um, so the consequences, if an attacker can actually spoof and actually say, hey, I'm a switch, I have a trunk connection to you, let's, let's make things happen, they can generate frames for any VLAN that's supported over that trunk. So there could be multiple VLANs that they can actually get access to. 
Um, they can communicate with any device on those associated VLANs bidirectionally. Um, and also allows attackers to eavesdrop on the traffic within that target VLAN because they're already on that broadcast domain. If they want to listen to broadcast messages or do man in the middle attacks, they're already positioned. <clears throat> okay, so here's a demo. Uh, basically, the setup this was actually from the research environment. So, uh, this was a proof of concept attack. We have an attacking machine, which is a, sitting there on a virtual switch and bridge, right? So, this is just a virtual machine. Um, over here, we have a regular 2950 Cisco switch, physical switch. Now, this is set to dynamic desirable by default out of the box. We plugged in the virtualized network into the, the switch port just as a basic communication network to get the virtual machines online. Um, not changing that port to a trunk port, which would be considered best practices to make that a trunk port. So we're just seeing if an administrator took the switch out of the box, plopped it down, plugged in the uh, virtual network, what's going to happen? Over here, we actually have it set up correctly. We have a trunk link between the Cisco 2950 and the virtual switcher bridge. So this is actually set up per best practices. We're supporting VLANs 1 and 20 over this. And then we have a virtual machine sitting inside here on the, the virtualized network that's sitting on VLAN 20. So we have an attacker that's out there. He's just sitting on the, the default VLAN, trying to get in, trying to negotiate that trunk link, and seeing if it can actually uh, send data to the virtual machine. So let's check this out. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're using the, uh, the vSphere environment. And I have the switch over on the side. So we're going to just show the interface that we're connected to. So we're showing int FA021. So it's the 21st port. And we're just checking the status, and we see it's connected. So that Luminara is the um, ESXi server, right? And it's connected. Um, it's on VLAN 1. Um, just standard connection there. So let's see what happens next. We're looking over here on the properties, and we see that we have this test VLAN set up. I don't know if any of you guys can see that. It's kind of small. Um, over here, we're showing the status of the port that the system is connected to is set for non-trunking. Non so this is the attacking system port, and it's not set up as a trunk right now. So over on the test adapter for the target VM, we're seeing that it's set on that VLAN test network. Um, over here, we can see that we have 802.1 encapsulation set on that 20 port 21, but again, it's set for not trunking. So that's kind of key because this, this switch spoofing depends on that, that trunking mechanism. Okay, so down here we have the Kali VM we're looking at. Um, we're looking at the properties of that right now, and we can kind of see there that it's set for no VLAN. So this currently is set with no VLAN tag. So this is on our native VLAN, so this is for the attacking system. Pull the console on that. So now what we're going to try to do is from the ESXi virtual machine, the machine located in that environment, we're going to try to send a fake DTP spoof message to the Cisco switch on that port that's set to non-trunking, and we're going to try to change it over to a trunk port going through the virtualized environment, through the virtual switch. So we're just going to fire up your Cynia, and we're going to send the DTP packet. So just choose the uh, dynamic trunking protocol. And then it's going to send out, we're just going to choose zero here to send the packet. And then we can see it's, it was originally set for access desirable, and then it immediately turned over to trunk auto. So we were able to successfully change it to a trunk port. And now here you can see the line went down for the interface, and it came back up. And if we show it status on that, it is now a trunk port. So that went through the virtual switch from the VM through the virtual switch into the physical network, and it was able to change that physical port on that switch to a, a trunking port. And now you can have access to any system on that network. Um, so why does this work? And what else did it work on? Let me get this back running work. Okay, so I found this worked on any virtual network that was using bridging. If you were using a, a switch like OpenV switch or the Cisco Nexus 1000V um, or the Hyper-V standard virtual switch, um, Citrix Zen server uses OpenV switch, an implementation of it. Those were not affected because they were actually blocking that DTP packet from going through. It wasn't necessary. Their ports didn't even see it. It didn't acknowledge it. However, anything that was using a mode of bridging, um, 
our physical Kali 2.0 control system. So we actually tried it with just a basic control using physical systems to see if we could actually put the switch into trunking mode before attempting it from a virtualized environment. Um, then we, we saw that it would actually work from anything with bridging. So the open uh, source Zen with bridging, ESXi server, basically acts as a bridge. It's not using a virtual switch implementation, it's using a virtual bridge impl implementation. And then Proxmox using bridge mode as well. So it just basically acted as a pass-through and allowed that DTP packet to go through that virtual network and affect the physical switch. So mitigation, disable any unused switch ports, disable CDP and DTP, or use on a per port basis, right? If you have two switches that you're connecting on a specific port, then maybe you can enable that stuff on there. But if you're just leaving open ports set to DTP auto, that's a pretty bad practice. Um, limit VLAN access on trunk ports to only what the connected segments require. So if the trunk only needs, you know, 1 in 20 or 25 and 30 for that particular network, don't give it every other VLAN just to have them all on there. Um, you're opening yourself up to attacks. So configure all ports as access ports, no trunking with no access to the native VLAN. Disable ports too, right, you're not using. So it's just down to port security. Let's talk a little bit about double tagging now. So this is an 802.1Q VLAN protocol that allows remote attackers to bypass network segmentation and spoof VLAN traffic via a message with two 802.1Q tags. So we call this double tagging because we're trying to take a frame and we're adding an additional VLAN tag to it to try to get that frame to jump over to a second VLAN. And there's an actual specific purpose for this. It is a part of the standard of 802.11 or 802.1Q standard. Um, this was designed to actually work this way. So what we're doing is we're exploiting the way this thing was designed to our advantage to get packets to where we want them to go. So here's how basic 802.1Q tagging works. We have two switches, and between them they have a trunk link, and in this case we're supporting VLANs 1, 2, and 3, where VLAN 1 is that native VLAN, and VLAN 2 and 3 are your access VLANs. We can see systems on each end of the switches there that are connected to VLAN 1, VLAN 2, or VLAN 1, 2, and 3, respectively. So let's just send a basic tagged VLAN, or VLAN packet over, right? This is your normal traffic. We have from the start machine, it's on VLAN 1, it's tagged with uh, the 1, and it's going to go through that first switch. And then it's going to go over the trunk link because it wants to go over and talk to the system over here on the other side on VLAN 1. So we go over that trunk, and then it just forwards that packet onto the correct VLAN, right? Pretty simple. That's how it's supposed to work. So double tagging. We have our normal Ethernet frame up top. We saw this before where we wedge in this extra VLAN tag here, right, to, to show that we're on that VLAN network for that segmentation. But down here, this is what a double tag frame looks like. So we're actually adding in an extra VLAN tag um, to that Ethernet frame. Okay, so here's how this process works. That first system is going to send out a packet now, but it's going to have two tags instead of one. So we're going to be tagged for one and two. Um, notice here that... It goes down here, this is on VLAN 2, it's rejected because the first tag is 1, we've only gone through the first switch, it reads that first tag, it doesn't read the second tag, so it cannot pass that packet over to that second machine down there. Um, but what happens is when we go through this first switch, that first tag is stripped off before it hits the trunk port, and now as it goes over the trunk port and, and hits the second switch, the second switch only sees that second tag. And this is how the VLAN hopping attack works. So what I did is I stripped off that first tag, now that packet goes on to, or that frame goes on to this machine over here located on VLAN 2. It no longer goes over to VLAN 1 because that tag was stripped off. Pretty simplistic stuff, and this was done by design so that you could move um, things between packets. Or between, between networks, I'm sorry. So now we just have another example, 1 and 3. Um, same difference, just we're just shooting over to a different VLAN, um, to a different target system. Now this is a one-way attack. Um, we cannot get information back, right? Because we're a target, we're a attacker system targeting somebody else on another VLAN. We're double tagging a packet and sending it across that network to the other side. In order for them to send a packet back to us, they're going to have to do the same process, right? They're going to have to double tag the packet and send it back to us. Because when they try to reply to that packet, if it's a simple ping or whatever, it's going to try to go back to that other system on that other VLAN, and it's, the system's currently in a totally different broadcast domain, so it doesn't know how to get that traffic to where it needs to be. Um, okay, so like I said, target system cannot respond back. Um, not a good attack for eavesdropping because you're just sending information. You can't listen to stuff on the way uh, back and forth. But it is an excellent method, method for de uh, denial of service attacks, right? Because I can send uh, packets to systems on other VLANs from a totally covert VLAN that I'm on on another side, and it, it's very hard to track where these things came from. 
Um, so I could be sending malicious packets over. It could also be used as a one-way covert channel. Maybe I want to send information um, to another system on another VLAN and do it covertly. I do it this way. Okay, so I got a few demos of this. A um, couple different scenarios here. This first scenario was more of a control scenario, so I have an attacking system that's on the physical network. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to send a double tag packet between two Cisco 2950 switches, um, both with these trunk links with VLANs 1 and 20 supported. And then we have a virtualized uh, environment here connected to that last Cisco 2950 switch over that trunk link. And this is best practices to have these trunk links on there. If you read the documentation, they want you to set up trunk links. Um, and then here we have an access link on VLAN 20 uh, in the virtualized network. So this is going to be a physical attacker on Kali two physical Cisco 2950 switches, and then a target VM on the Proxmox environment. Okay, same kind of setup here. In this uh, first window, we actually have the two switches. You can see two tabs there, so I'm showing the configuration of the first switch. Um, and we can see that first port we're connected. We're on VLAN 1. And that's the port that the, that the attacking system is connected to. Uh, here we're showing it's not trunking, but it's using that 802.1Q encapsulation. Now we'll show port 24, which this is the trunk link between the two Cisco 2950 switches. So the first switch was a 24 port switch, the second one was a 48 port switch. Um, and we can see that set up for trunking. And we can see that it is supporting VLANs um, 1 and 20 which are listed here. It actually has 1, 10, and 20 on there, but we're really concerned with VLAN 20. So if we go and look at the next switch, which is that second 2950 switch, we'll just check the interfaces on this one because we want to see what the connection for the trunk looks like between the two switches and then the trunk link between the switch and the virtualized environment. Okay, so port 29, we can see the system is Fisto on there. It had a Star Wars kind of theme going on. Um, it's set for a trunk port. It's supporting the, tr the same trunks as the original one, 1, 2, 10, and 20, 802.1Q encapsulation. And then we'll take a look at what the, uh, the virtualized environment is supporting. Or the, this is the, the trunk connection between the two uh, devices. And we can see that they're, that they're connected and there's a trunk port there between port 48 and then back to port 24 on the other switch. And that's supporting the VLANs as well using 802.1Q encapsulation. So in the middle here, we just have a terminal window on the physical Kali system. Um, that's going to be the attacking system. And then here is our target system on the Proxmox environment, which is just another Kali uh, system sitting over there. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the Yersinia utility again to launch the, uh, the VLAN hopping attack um, on the, the physical system. And then we're just going to use TCP dump over here to actually monitor to see if we actually get those packets sent across the network. So it's going to take a few to, to get this set up here. So just doing TCP dump over here, minus VV. And then we're just grepping out for ICMP. Um, in the middle, we're just going to run your Cinea minus I for interactive mode. Set up the interface. Now, this system had multiple interfaces on it, so I had to choose basically a default one there. Um, the one that was on the correct network. In this case, it was E2 to do these attacks from. So now on the bottom, there's settings. So when you go to launch, you're going to pick the DT or the 802.1Q um, attack here. And on the bottom, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a bunch of settings down here. Uh, we have the source VLAN, um, the source IP address, which can just be spoofed to whatever you want to set it to. In this case, I set it to 192.168.0.5, I believe. Um, and then the target VLAN is VLAN 2 that you want to set, which I just set to 20. So that's that target VLAN that the system's on. And then the destination IP. So what is the IP address of that system I'm trying to hit? <coughs> Excuse me. So down here, I'm spoofing the IP address of 192.168.0.5.5, and I'm trying to go to 192.168.1.111 is the target system. So totally different subnetwork, different VLAN. 
And we can see here that our target system is, in fact, sitting there on 192.168.1.111. Um, so we're going to start launching the attack from Yersinia now. Now I found that after you can sit here and watch this, and I'm launching the attack, and it sent out the ICMP packet. You can see there it goes 192.168.5.5, destination of 1.11, and the ICMP on ETH2, right? So we're sending that out, but we don't see anything over here yet. It, take, it took a little bit of time. I, I had to run this attack a few times, just launching it, running it like this, just keep, keep hitting it. And I'm like, oh, man, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. I'm not going to get my PhD. This sucks. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, things start happening. So it was successful. So I'm giving this talk in Norway, and I do this. And there was a guy in the back, and they, they warned us that Norwegians are not going to talk when you're in the conference, and they don't like to speak until afterward. But he actually raised his hand. He said, you know why that's happening? You know why you're getting that delay? And I'm like, you know, I've been trying to figure that one out. He's like, you're doing DNS lookups on your TCP dump still. <laughs> so we would have seen this stuff a lot quicker if I basically turned off the flag for DNS um, lookups on there. So I was like, oh, thank you. I've been trying to figure that one out for a little while. And it was just a stupid little thing to overlook, right? So when you're using TCP dump, that's a good lesson to learn. If you're getting some sort of delays and you're waiting for something to happen, maybe turn off DNS if you're not trying to do a DNS. If you're just doing IP lookup, right? It's basic stuff. Um, but when you're doing complicated stuff like that, sometimes you overlook the basics. So uh, good lesson learned. Okay, so that was that. We, we've proven now that we can go through um, two physical switches and actually do the, the VLAN hopping attack as intended, right? Through those two switches from a physical system. And we actually made it into the virtual machine, to the virtualized environment. So that was our control. Let's strip away one of those physical switches, right? Let's actually see if we can do this from a virtualized network through a virtualized switch, into a physical switch, out the other end into a virtual switch, and then hit another VM on the other side on a totally different network, in a totally different environment. Right? So in this case, the attacker is a Zen server virtual machine, and the target's a Proxmox virtual machine. Um, I'm not trying to beat on Proxmox. I actually love Proxmox. It's a great environment, so don't get me wrong here. But um, And all these videos are available on YouTube. There's a lot more, too, of the, the progression. There's, I have stuff up on there for the Mac flooding attacks that you guys can look at if you want to. Um, OK, same scenario. We've got our physical switch over here that we're looking at. Um, we have our Citrix Zen server VM here and our Proxmox target here. <clears throat> and we're looking at the whole dump here. We have uh, Fisto, which is the Proxmox server, set up with the trunk port, best practices. Our Citrix server was mall, and that's set up as a trunk port as well. And then we're just verifying the stuff just to make sure that all the settings were correct again. And you guys have seen most of the stuff, so I could probably, for the interest of time, jump ahead a little bit. 8021 encapsulation. OK, so here we're looking at the networking for the VM in the Citrix environment. And now the heart of this attack is having access to that admin or native VLAN on the switch, right? So I had to make sure that here we're tagging uh, the Proxmox for 20. We saw earlier there that the, the Citrix VM had no VLAN tag associated with it that put it on that native VLAN. If you try to tag it with one, it's not on the native VLAN anymore, according to the, how C Citrix is actually doing their networking. So if you're trying this stuff at home, set it to, to nothing, just disable VLANing, and it will be on the admin VLAN. Um, again, over here, we're just using TCP dump, grepping for ICMP. Again, without DNS turned off. So. We'll have a little bit of a delay. And then over here, we're just going to launch your Cynia and, and run through the attack again. So this was very systematic. You can see as I was doing the research, I was approaching it as, well, can I do it how you're supposed to do it? And then can I take away something and do it the way I think I may be able to do it? And then can I keep taking away stuff and keep trying different things? And, um, but we did it uh, the same way every time. right? So now I'm setting the, the, the settings down on the bottom here. I'm going to launch the attack. And then we'll actually see what happens. So again, for time, I'll just scooch forward here a little bit. We're setting up that attack. Here we see we're, we're sending that packet again across the network. And then we start just jamming those, those attack packets across. And again, I'm like, oh, this isn't going to work. It's not going to work. But after quite a while, it worked. Right? So. Again, different environments. Now we're going from a virtualized environment through a virtual switch into a physical switch, out the other end into another virtualized switch into a totally different VLAN on a totally different environment. Um, so this gets kind of scary, right? 
Now I'm going to take it one step further. And let's strip it all away. Let's see if we can really just go from a physical attacker through a single 2950 physical switch and actually have this be that second hop and strip it off, right? Because before I had two switches before, or I had you know, two physical switches before, or I had a physical and a virtual. So really you could say that, oh, you didn't really make it into the virtual switch before. You already made it to that, that VLAN when you hit that second physical switch. You're not doing anything special. But when we took that first physical switch away, now we were going from virtual to virtual. Now we're taking everything away, and we just have a physical switch and a virtual switch. Two switches, one's physical, one's virtual. Can we make it over here to the end? Um, so we have attacker's physical Kali, and in this case, I tried to step it up a little bit. We've been picking up Proxmox, but let's go super enterprise level. Hyper-V guest with a Cisco Nexus 1000V. How many of you guys have tried to configure a Cisco Nexus 1000V? He's laughing. Yeah, he's not laughing. He's pretty serious back there, but he knows the pain you go through configuring this thing. Anyway, let's see what happens. Does Cisco have it down? Same setup, right? But in this case, <clears throat> I have two tabs over here now. One is our physical switch, the 2950. Again, we're going to look at all the same stuff. The other tab, though, is we have our configuration for our Nexus 1000V. Um, but let's just verify this stuff for sake of completeness. So our attacking physical system, which is in the middle, is connected on VLAN 1. The target system is over there on the other side. We want to check our uh, status of our port connected to the virtual switch of the uh, Cisco system. So here's the Hyper-V. We're set at the trunk port on that, connected to that Cisco uh, Nexus 1000V. And the trunking information there. In this case, the VM was on, on VLAN 10 when I set it up on the Cisco. Um, but we're still supporting all the, the same VLANs that we were using before. Okay, so let's jump up here. Now we're looking at that Cisco Nexus 1000V. He's probably shuddering there. I don't want to see that again. <laughs> so we can see again we're set up with a trunk port here um, connected to VLAN 10, right, for that network connection. VETH1 is the one connecting back um, to our actual switch, physical switch. Okay, so the attacking system and the target system. We're just going to do the same kind of setup again. TCP dump, grepping for ICMP. And then over on the other side, running our Yersinia. And we'll just kind of fly through a little bit more. Setting it up. Okay, over here we're looking at the IP. So let's see what happens when we start launching this thing. Okay, so there's the packet going out, and again, we're just kind of jamming it away. Still not seeing much on the other end. And then, boom, there it all is. So, yeah, even, even Cisco couldn't stop it. It went through. Um, so this worked across every platform. It's just the way the protocol works, and you can exploit it however you want. Um, the utilities are out there to do it, and it will work in virtualized and physical environments and allow you to cross between both worlds. So protect your data centers. So double tagging results, just a high-level overview here. Um, over here, results of attack, single switch, double switch. Um, so we can see this work pretty much in every single environment, right? The, the double tagging attack for both looking at a, a single virtual, uh, virtual or a single physical switch or a double uh, physical switches. Um, it did not work in Microsoft standard virtual switch. Why not? Why is Microsoft standard vSwitch in server 2012 stopping this from working? You would really think that would not be the one that actually is the outlier in this list. Uh, but what they actually did is in server 2008, they started putting something into their virtualized networking that basically blocks any kind of max, max spoofing. So, what we can see with this VLAN hopping attack is that you're, you're spooking, spoofing your MAC address when you're sending out the attacks. So by spoofing your MAC address, um, the, the virtual switch is actually catching that and it's, it's blocking those packets from going through. So that actually prevented it from occurring. 
Now, if you start looking through a lot of the, the forums and stuff out there on why they did this, it, it seems like it just kind of ended up getting in there by somehow by accident, by the design. And now you start finding a lot of threads out there of people trying to figure out how to disable that feature. Um, so Microsoft, if you try to go out and try to look up, you know, Mac spoofing protection, virtual LAN switch, you'll find their basic um, kind of, uh, what is it, promo material about the, um, the server and why it has that, but it doesn't tell anything about it. And then the only technical details you can find about it are their published details on how to disable it. Then once you disable it, you could do this type of attack. So don't know, that's kind of backwards. Uh, the other side, can I launch the attacks from the virtualized environments, right? When we had that virtual switch, we were coming from the virtual switch, going into the networks. Could it be launched from them? And we can see that, yes, it could from the different bridged areas, um, Proxmox, Zen server we tried. Again, standard switch uh, stopped it from happening. Microsoft Cisco Net Nexus 1000V stopped it because there's some pretty strict VLAN controls on there when you're trying to access other VLANs going outbound um, that prevented the attack from occurring. Um, and ESXi didn't really figure out why that prevented it from occurring, but it wasn't able to go out from the ESXi system. Okay, mitigation. Do not assign any host to VLAN 1 or that native VLAN. Disable VLAN 1 on all unnecessary ports. Maybe even change your native VLAN to something more obscure, right? Um, restrict access to switches by MAC addresses. So we're seeing a lot of physical layer, um, actual physical system security here because these virtualized systems are connected to your physical network eventually. And we can see that these attacks are actually affecting that too. So you need to protect that stuff. How are we doing on time? Ooh. Okay, I have a whole other section to go into. We're at 350. Um, your choice. I don't mind. I'll keep talking if you guys want me to. Is it 340? Okay, then my clock is wrong, so let's keep rolling. <laughs> Are there any questions at this point on the stuff I've already presented? Yes? You mean just basically connect two virtual environments with a crossover cable and try it that way? I never tried that. I was trying to go for the bigger stuff, right? But that, that's a good question. <laughs> that is a good question. So that's something maybe you could try, right? And then and let us know. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of at my end. I've done this stuff for four years now. I got a PhD out of it. I'm, this is kind of my last talk. I'm moving on to bigger things. I'm letting my students now talk, right? These guys did a great job on their stuff or stuff. Um, let's talk about the R spoofing. But that, that is a good question. Maybe I'll have some students work on that one at some point. Yeah. <laughs> eating your Chinese food. <laughs> okay, ARP, address resolution protocol. So each system on a network maintains this ARP cache, right? And it's this translation between your layer two addresses and your layer three addresses. So the systems know how to communicate with each other in a, in a single broadcast domain. Um, ARP caches will differ between different systems, right? Because not every system on the network needs to communicate with each other. They don't need to know about each other. Usually ARP broadcasts happen when a system wants to talk to another system. So they say, hey, who's got this address? There it is. Tell this, ad this IP address, right? Tell me who has it. So then we get this um, MAC address back from that system that actually has that on the network. So it's just a broadcast out. And then it's a unicast back. So only the system requesting it gets the answer back and then populates its ARP cache with the update. Um, so this allows it to not have to do this broadcast later on in the, in the line. If it needs to communicate with that system again, it already has that table so it knows what the translation is. So how can we uh, break this? ARP spoofing is a, is a pretty well-known attack, right? Um, basically, what we did is we, we did this in the virtualized environment. So we created um, multiple test scenarios where we had a router virtual machine going out to the physical network uh, interface card of the, the virtualized uh, environment and then going out to the cloud, right? So we're just plugged into the, to the data center at that point. And then we have that target virtual machine, and then we have a virtual switch. So in this case, we're trying to do ARP spoofing like you asked within a single environment, right, to see if it actually works. Um, so this is not a multi-tenant host. So what we do is we pop that attacking virtual machine down there on the switch, and then we try to redirect all the traffic through. So the, virtual, the target virtual machine is going to end up uh, sending its traffic because of the MAC address spoofing and the ARP spoofing um, to the attacker virtual machine because it's going to think that it's sending it to the actual router because the attacker spoofed um, its address to make the target virtual machine think that it is the router. And it also poisoned the router's information to think that it is the 
target system is trying to send the data through. So we have a nice little man in the middle there. Um, so we have a quick demo on this one. The attacker is a physical Kali system, um, and the target system is going to be uh, VMware ESXi. Okay, so over here we have our router. And we can see the ARP cache on that router. We're showing um, the MAC address of 22 and 21, and these are the virtual machines here, uh, 22, or 21 and 22. So this is our target VM. This is our attacking VM, Kali 1, Kali 2. And we can see the ARP caches are all correct right now. Um, they're all pointing to the right locations, right? We have 21 pointing to 22 correctly. We have one pointing to one correctly at different areas. Uh, the router knows which one each of the Kali's are correctly, and each of the Kali's know what the router is, and it's... Uh, other VM on the network. So what we did is, um, how many of you guys have read the Black Hat Python book? Anybody? Some of my students who took the class. Well, we found out that we, I, I had a class that, if you saw the Stuffer presentation, that's kind of where that came from. And the Black Hat Python book was the book that we used for that class. Now, as these guys will tell you, it was a fun class, wasn't it? Yeah. So the Black Hat Python book, the code is quite broken. Um, so we spent a lot of time fixing a lot of that code. And the art poisoning code that was in there was what I used for this attack, but it was slightly modified. Um, so if you get the Black Hat Python book, you can kind of read and understand this art poisoning script a little better. Um, so here we go. We're setting this up. And then on the attacking machine, we ran the script. And what it does is it poison, as you can see by, by showing the ARP cache. Now the router, if we look back here, both those MAC addresses are the same, 21 and 22. So the router thinks that the attacking system is the target system. And if we look on the target system, we can see that, wow, well, the router is now the MAC address of 22, which is the attacking system, right? And it thinks it's the router. So now we're just pinging Google from the, attacking, or from the target system to see what's going on. And over here, um, this, this script automatically sniffs the first 100 packets and writes them to a file. So we're looking at that, and we're, we got it down to dump.pcap. And then it restores the ARP cache back. So after I've sniffed the traffic in the virtualized environment, I'm going to go ahead and remake everything back to nice. So all the MAC addresses and translations in the ARP table are now reset. Um, if we look, they're reset back to what they should be. So the router knows the correct systems there, and the target system should also know the correct systems. So if we look at the dump file now, um, I basically just wrote a little TCP dump script in this case to just parse that dump file. And here we go. We can see all the information that we gathered while we were pinging Google from the target system is now on the attacking system. So we're able to successfully perform the man-in-the-middle attack. Thank you. Um, <laughs> through, the, uh, through the virtualized environment. So this was contained within a single ESXi environment, and it worked. And this, as we'll see here in the next slide, was not stopped by any environment. So there's no default protection against this. So in order to protect yourself against ARP poisoning, ARP spoofing, um, you're going to need some sort of third-party application or some other feature in there to add, add on top of your virtualized environment until you know, these vendors start getting on top of things and start building in these controls for us. Um, ARP Watch is a Linux utility. Very useful for detecting problems with ARP tables on the network. So this is one that could you know, trigger, basically, if there's some sort of strange thing going on with the ARP traffic, um, on your network, it will send you email alerts to let you know pretty much instantaneously. So um, this is something you may want to start implementing if you're running data centers and you kind of think you might be susceptible to this kind of attack. Um, start implementing something like ARPWatch just to look. Uh, we also have, uh, in Microsoft environment, you have um, different ways of looking at ARP cache or ARP poisoning too. You also have um, ways to validate ARP requests on Cisco switches, physical switches, so dynamic ARP um, inspection. Um, th those things will actually help you out as well if you're running a Cisco environment. A DHCP snooping, which is a prereq to dynamic ARP inspection. So conclusion, virtualized, or virtual versus physical. Really, our results show that virtualized networking, or virtualized networking devices can have the same or even greater risk of um, being vulnerable to these attacks right, than their physical counterparts. With physical devices, we have a lot more levels of control built into them um, to actually prevent this stuff from occurring, like basically... Uh, port security, things like that, that aren't in these, uh, these virtualized switches. So really, there's no one best system after looking at all the environments that we tested. There's not one really high performer that really was more secure out of all of them. Uh, we saw that Hyper-V environment did block a couple of attacks just because of that 
little bit of max spoofing protection it had in there. Um, but how's the usability compared to other environments? You know, you have to weigh that into effect as well. So lack of sophisticated layer two security control similar to what's available in enterprise grade physical switches greatly increases the difficulty in securing virtual switches against these attacks. So like I said, these virtual switches aren't really up to par yet with their physical counterparts that have been out there for 20 years and been redeveloped and you know, enhanced uh, with new firmware updates, things like that with new greater controls. So unless the vendors start getting on top of this with the virtual switch implementations, we're still going to be at their mercy or having to put other solutions in there to prevent from these kind of attacks from occurring. So bottom line, single malicious, mach or malicious virtual machine has the potential to sniff all traffic passing over a virtual switch and can even affect that physical network, as I've shown. Um, so you can go in and out. Significant threat to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of all data passing over a network in a multi-tenant environment. So what can users do? If you're a user having data in these multi-tenant environments, you can basically start questioning your hosting provider. What kind of security controls do you have? What kind of access do I have to actually implement things that help my network and my data be more secure? Maybe I just start using encryption for everything, right? So that if my data is um, compromised, it's still encrypted, so it's hard, harder for the attacker to get a hold of. Um, threat detection and alerting, all this stuff can be questioned. Ask your providers, make them start answering these questions when you start paying those bills. What are you doing to secure my data? Not just how much is it? Um, okay, here's my email contact information. You can get me through my Clarkson email. I'm also at Utica. Um, or my business is ronnie.bull at adirondackitsolutions.com. All the links to my publications, presentations um, are all found on my blog. Uh, you can get my DEF CON talks there, DerbyCon talks, all that stuff is there. Um, special thanks to Dr. Gina Matthews, who was the presenter before me. She was my PhD advisor in all this, and as well as a lot of students. Um, a few of them in this room that have helped me along the lines setting up these environments and maintaining them and helping me run these tests. So, any questions? No questions. I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I'll be around later if you guys want to stop and talk to me individually or whatever, that's fine. Um, but thank you for your time. Yes. You. Have you tried uh, switching traffic between like two EC2 instances and two different AWS accounts? Uh, well, okay. Yeah. That, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what you're asking <clears throat> me as a web developer. Right. So I, I have been, over the past few years, I've been in contact with AWS people because you cannot do pen testing vulnerability assessment work on their networks without going through a lot of paperwork, the right channels, and getting the approval, right? So I could have, but I'm try I was trying to do this research as a PhD student, not as just some black hat or gray hat. Um, so I had to do things, you know, systematically. So I've, I've been in contact with them. We've had meetings with them, talked with them quite a bit about trying to do this. It's, there's a lot of roadblocks to getting into Amazon. I think uh, Sean was just at CCDC with us. Our team actually did very well there. Um, we, we ran into the guy that runs the data centers for Amazon there. So we were trying to really start building more of a relationship to get students doing these tests in those kind of areas. However, he did tell us that this stuff is not going to work on Amazon. He said, he, that, I mean, I, I can't really get into the details, but he did say that they are doing a lot of special stuff behind the scenes as proprietary that prevents a lot of this stuff from occurring. Now we're getting into things like OpenStack, a lot more complexity, which could introduce more vulnerabilities, right? And then we could start talking about SDN all we want, but then you could talk about you know, how those controllers can get compromised, and then your network is just a bunch of puppet strings all over the place. So if you go and do you can download my full dissertation here as well and read that, and I start talking about things like you know, using SDN and the complications. I've actually wrote solutions that make SDN solutions much more simpler, so I just wrote Python scripts to fix some of these issues as well, a lot of the DHCP attacks I proposed. Um, you could have done with SDN to fix them, but I wrote simple Python scripts instead to show that you don't need that overhead, right? So there's, there's a lot of questions you need and a lot more exploring we could do in this. Um, and we're trying to develop research at the schools, to, at Clarkson and Utica, to, to kind of go further and work with industry partners to, to keep moving forward on this, because it is important, as he said. So, any others? Yes? I was just trying to think.
Yeah. Yeah. See, I couldn't, I couldn't do a dissertation on theory alone. I'm a practical person. I need to do hands-on stuff, so I had to break stuff. And I was very lucky to be able to do this and break stuff, you know, and it's, it's, it was great. So I, I'm very gracious for my advisor for letting me pursue this. And uh, yeah, without, without the demos and the actual real prototypes and, and proof of concepts, this research would not have been worth even sitting here and listening to, in my mind. So I appreciate all your time. Anybody else? Okay, thank you.